I have a little Jack Russell dog named Zoe, and she's always full of life, which means our walks can sometimes last up to two hours. This day, I returned from work around 5.30 p.m., and the sun usually sets between 6.30 and 7 p.m. Right after I got home, I put Zoe on her leash, quickly changed, and we went out. The walk started typically, with Zoe leading the way, happily trotting in whatever direction caught her fancy. However, things began to change about an hour later when the sun was nearly set, and, to my dismay, I realized I had walked further than I thought. When you often take long walks with your dog, it's easy to lose track of time, especially when your dog doesn't stop much. We ventured in a direction I usually take, but the street we were on was unfamiliar, although I generally knew how to get back. I decided to turn back, but Zoe stopped and started to whimper softly, which was unusual for her. That's when I saw it. In the dimming light of the sunset, a huge coyote was standing in the middle of the road, staring right at us. It was as big as a golden retriever, with tangled, dirty fur. Its mouth was slightly open, revealing its sharp, yellow-stained teeth. I instantly knew it was a threat. I picked Zoe up and began to walk the other way. I felt a bit scared but hoped the coyote would just leave us alone. I wasn't familiar with these streets but I knew I had to keep moving. As I hurried on, the coyote followed us at a distance. The darker it got, the more frightened I became. After wandering through unknown neighborhood streets in the darkness, I realized with horror that I was lost. All the turns had confused me, and I had no idea which way was home. Now, in the pitch dark, I could see the glowing eyes of the creature and hear it yipping and howling. As I continued, every few minutes, another pair of glowing eyes would join the first, and the howling grew louder and closer. I was terrified, trying to hold back my tears as panic overwhelmed me, fearing for both Zoe's life and mine. Every so often I passed under a streetlight and glanced back to see an entire pack of coyotes following us, moving slowly and keeping their eyes fixed on us. After nearly 45 minutes of this, I was exhausted and realized I was far from the safety of my home. Zoe's whimpering grew louder, which only made me more upset, knowing she sensed the danger we were in. The howling and yipping became more frequent, growing louder and closer. I glanced back again to see all their glowing eyes peering at me from just 30 to 40 feet away, but suddenly, they started to move aside, clearing the middle of the road. A moment later, a small car crept through the parted crowd of coyotes and pulled up beside me. The driver, a woman, rolled down her window and asked if I needed help. I was immensely relieved and quickly asked her to drive me home. Normally, I would never consider getting into a car with someone I didn't know, but I didn't see any other option. The woman was very kind and looked genuinely scared for me. By then, I was crying, overwhelmed by the close escape from what could have been a vicious attack. She drove me home, which turned out to be almost 20 minutes away from where she found me. I live in a peaceful neighborhood, the kind where you don't worry much about theft or carjackings. However, the one increasing threat here, and in nearby areas, is coyotes. Several years have passed since that terrifying night and it seems the coyotes are only getting more numerous, bigger, and bolder. Everyone in town is warned to be careful, especially in parks filled with trees that provide perfect hiding spots for them. Signs have been put up to inform people about areas where groups of 3 to 20 coyotes have been seen. There have been news reports of coyotes jumping fences to snatch small pets and larger animals found mutilated in children's play areas. These are heartbreaking and somewhat frightening stories but you don't really feel the immediate threat of coyotes until you find yourself being stalked in the dead of night by a pack of hungry, merciless predators. I have a part-time job at a small gas station on the outskirts of town, close to the residential areas. It's a normal-looking station, nothing out of the ordinary. The place isn't scary or lonely at all. I only started working here because the rent was getting too high, and my main job wasn't enough anymore. The only shift that fit with my other job schedule was the night shift, and gas stations are one of the few places that need people at night. This story takes place about 10 months ago. It was a chilly night with some leftover snow on the ground from a recent snowstorm, but otherwise, the night was pretty typical. Since the station is near the suburbs, we don't get much traffic. Usually, just a few cars drive by now and then. 
By midnight, only a few cars had stopped for gas every hour. After a while, I got so bored that I left the counter to tidy up the shelves. Just a few minutes later, I heard the door swing open. I looked up to see a man walking straight toward the counter. He leaned in closely, his eyes darting from side to side, as if searching for someone else who might assist him. Can I help you with something? I asked, walking back to the counter. The man jerked around, almost startled by my voice. He paused, seemingly uneasy, then muttered, No, I'm good, and hurried out of the store. It was clear to me he needed help with something, but his behavior made me think of something more sinister, like a robbery. After all, working at a gas station, the thought was always at the back of my mind. I watched him walk out to a car that was oddly parked near the fuel pumps, not quite in a proper parking space. He drove off quickly. I couldn't be sure if he was really up to no good, but everything about his actions seemed suspicious. Maybe my presence near him rather than at the counter had thrown him off, enough to change his mind. I spent a few minutes considering this and decided it must have been an attempted robbery. I called the police just in case he planned to target another station. The police promised to send an officer to take my report within a few minutes. I hung up, but then, almost immediately, the same car returned to the lot. It pulled into the same odd spot and just sat there, engine running. I could swear there were two people moving inside the car now. Nervously, I locked the front doors and watched. The car stayed put, the occupants seemingly biding their time, waiting for something. Fortunately, the police arrived quickly and recognized the car from my description. They blocked it in. There wasn't much commotion when the officers approached the car. One officer walked up and pulled two men out of the car, one of whom was the man who had come into the store earlier. They tried to act innocent, but the situation was too suspicious. When the police checked their car, they found a chilling collection of items in the trunk, weapons, ropes, tape, and other ominous materials. Both men were arrested, but the incident left me shaken, realizing what they might have intended. If I hadn't called the police after that initial odd encounter, I might have faced something far worse than a robbery. I might have disappeared that night. This summer, I've been spending a lot of time at my buddy Joe's place. Joe lives with his dad on a big piece of land that's pretty far out, about a 20 minute drive from my home. I'm already living on the edge of town, so it feels like we're out in the middle of nowhere. Joe's dad is a vet, and he's got a small animal hospital right on their land. Besides that, they have all sorts of animals like chickens, pigs, and sheep at their home. Their driveway is long, winding about 300 feet from the gate to their front door, passing through trees and by barns and fields where the animals are. It looks ordinary in the daylight, but it's usually dark by the time I get there, so I can only see by my car lights or the flashlight on my phone. If there's no light from the house or moonlight, it's tough to see where I'm going, but the house itself is always a blast. They've got a swimming pool, a massive TV, a big piano, giant speakers that connect to Bluetooth, lots of pets like dogs and cats, and plenty of space to wander around. Joe's dad and his girlfriend usually keep to themselves in the evening, so Joe pretty much has the run of the place. We often have friends over. Joe likes having people around. One evening, we invited a new friend, Dave, who we'd met downtown. Dave was nice, but seemed a little clueless. When he got there, we let the dogs out front to welcome him and relax a bit. Looking down the driveway, I realized there was no extra car there. I asked Dave where he parked, and he said his mom had dropped him off and he'd catch an Uber back. Joe and I were surprised because everyone usually drove themselves. We felt bad for not telling Dave, knowing it might be hard to get an Uber to come out here so late, but he didn't seem worried and said it would be okay. We told him he could crash in the loft if he couldn't get a ride. The night went on pretty well, even though I ended up drinking more than I planned. After swimming and gaming, we were chilling on the porch with music when I needed to rest and went to lie down inside on the couch. I felt dizzy but not sick. I was trying to relax when Dave came inside. He said he had managed to book an Uber that was almost at the gate. He asked if I could walk him to the gate because it was dark and he didn't know the way. Without thinking much, I said yes and we left the house. Only then did I realize I wasn't ready for even a short walk in the dark. No shirt, no flashlight, no phone. I was only wearing my swimming shorts and some worn out flip-flops. 
On our walk to the gate, Dave used the light from his phone to show us the way. I walked with him up to the last turn before the gate, and just as we reached it, we saw the headlights of his Uber light up the path. I said goodbye. He walked through the gate and I turned to go back. Immediately, I noticed the darkness swallowing everything around me. As I turned the bend, I couldn't see a thing. I reached into my pocket for my phone and realized I didn't have it with me. I thought about running back to Dave to borrow his light, but I didn't want to delay him, so I decided to keep moving. I figured I'd just follow the path and eventually see the house lights. Right then I couldn't see anything. The trees and bushes made it impossible to see through. If the porch light had been on, maybe it wouldn't have been so bad, but only the inside lights were lit. And it was the worst timing. It was a new moon night, and it had already set. The night was overcast, and we were far from any city lights. It was the darkest night I'd ever seen. A wave of panic started to rise inside me, but I pushed it down. I moved slowly, taking careful steps. But the darkness in my slightly tipsy state made me stumble. In just 15 seconds, I wandered off the path into the dirt and had to find my way back. Soon after, I lost the path again. I waited for my eyes to adjust so I could see something, anything, in front of me, but it was like walking with my eyes shut. I tried to listen for the music from the porch, but all I heard were crickets. Even the farm animals were silent, wrapped in the quiet of the night. I hoped the crickets wouldn't stop chirping. Complete silence was the last thing I needed. Caught up in my thoughts, I didn't realize I had strayed from the path again until I felt my flip-flops sinking into the soft ground. I paused, straining my eyes to catch a hint of light. I saw a few lights but couldn't tell which one was from Joe's house and which were from distant neighbors, hidden by dense trees. I felt drawn to one light in particular and started towards it. A few steps later, I bumped into a tree. I recoiled and tried to see what hit me, but all I could make out was a vague, pale shape. I knew I had to keep my hands in front of me to avoid more collisions. I turned 90 degrees, hoping to find my way back to the driveway, and kept walking. Then, I felt something terrible brush against my hands. A massive spider web enveloped me. It wasn't just a few strands. It felt like walking into a wall of sticky threads. In a panic, I thrashed around, slapping at my arms and body, trying to rid myself of the web and any spiders that might be lurking. After a minute of frantic movements, I felt clear of the web. Now my heart was pounding and panic had fully set in. I tried to calm down, to breathe normally, but I was hopelessly lost. Part of me wanted to just sit down and wait until I could see, whether that meant waiting for dawn or for someone to come find me. These thoughts raced through my mind. Would anyone even look for me for hours? The only person who knew I had gone out was Dave, and he was already on his way home. I had no way to contact him or anyone else. Joe and the others might think I'd just gone to sleep in the loft and wouldn't bother looking for me for a while. If I tried walking towards a light, I could end up going the wrong way, maybe even wander onto someone else's property. They might think I was there to cause trouble and react badly. And the woods? Was I already lost among the trees? Had I accidentally run deeper into them in my panic? I always thought I'd know what to do if I got lost. I assumed I'd have my phone or at least some light. I never imagined I'd be in complete darkness. Out here it's so remote and wooded. I doubted anyone would hear me even if I screamed for help. Sitting still and waiting seemed sensible, but also felt ridiculous. My pride told me I wasn't helpless yet. I couldn't just stay out all night, an easy target for mosquitoes, ants, spiders, or any predators that might be lurking, thinking I was an easy meal. I knew the house couldn't be more than a few hundred feet away. I just needed to figure out the right direction. I had to think clearly, despite the panic and the effects of the alcohol. I closed my eyes and focused on breathing for a few minutes to calm down. When I opened my eyes, I looked up and noticed the sky had a slight glow, just enough to outline the clouds against the trees. I scanned around and spotted a solid shape that looked like a barn roof. This could either lead me back to the path or further away. I decided to take the risk and headed towards it, walking slowly with my arms stretched out in front. Then I saw it, a faint line on the ground. It was the driveway. Feeling a surge of relief, I stepped onto it and followed the dim view of lights. I kept stumbling off the path and even ran into a branch, but eventually, 
I saw the house. Walking through that front door never felt so comforting. I went straight to the porch to share the scary ordeal I just survived. It might have been just a few minutes, but it was genuinely terrifying. I learned never to venture out here unprepared again. I spent most of my 20s living in a small, affordable apartment because it was just me and I needed to save money. The building was tiny, with only six apartments. Most of the neighbors were older, retired folks who liked their privacy. I appreciated that, as I'm often in a hurry or just not in the mood to chat when I come and go. For nearly two years, the apartment across from mine was occupied by an elderly couple. I never really spoke to them and didn't think much of it when they moved out. It took several months before someone new moved in, and even then, I didn't meet the new neighbor right away. One morning, as I was preparing my lunch for work, I heard the door of the new neighbor open. I didn't pay much attention until I noticed that the door didn't shut. After I finished getting ready, I put on my shoes, opened my door, and was surprised to see that my neighbor's door was still open. Standing there was a tall man, probably in his 40s or 50s, just outside his apartment, facing me. He greeted me with a smile and introduced himself. I managed a brief smile, gave him my name, mentioned I was off to work, and tried to pass by him. But as I headed for the stairs, he invited me to join him for breakfast. I found it odd since I had just told him I was in a rush. I politely declined and hurried down the stairs. At work, I couldn't help but feel unsettled by that weird encounter. Luckily, when I returned home, I didn't run into anyone. But the next morning, I was woken up by a knock at my door. Annoyed, since I didn't have to be up yet, I quickly got dressed and answered. There he was again, my neighbor, standing by his open door. He invited me for breakfast once more. This time, I firmly declined and asked him not to disturb me so early. He didn't take it well and just stood there, suggesting I didn't need to rush as I had time to join him. His insistence felt increasingly unsettling. I firmly refused, stepped back and closed my door tightly, making sure it was locked. The more I thought about him, the more disturbed I felt by our interactions. The rest of my day was normal, and I got home around 6 p.m. I made dinner, watched a movie, and prepared for bed by 11 p.m. As I lay there, thoughts of my unsettling neighbor circled in my head. I resolved that if anything else happened, I would call the building's owner. After turning off my light, I tried to clear my mind and fall asleep, hoping for a better tomorrow. Just minutes after I turned off the light, I heard the neighbor's door squeak open. I lay there, holding my breath, trying to figure out what he was doing. The silence that followed was thick and unsettling because, once again, I didn't hear his door close. My heart was pounding as I lay in the darkness, wondering about his intentions at such a late hour. Despite my nerves, exhaustion eventually took over and I drifted off to sleep. However, it wasn't a restful sleep. It felt more like I was just hovering on the edge of consciousness. I'm not sure how long I had been asleep when I was jolted awake by a series of loud knocks. These weren't coming from my front door. They were right at my bedroom door. Panic gripped me, and I snapped on the light instantly. The only potential weapon within reach was a small screwdriver from my nightstand. I snatched it up, my hands trembling as I dialed 911 on my phone. The police arrived quickly. I rushed out of my bedroom to meet them, relieved but shaken. Although my door had been closed and there was no sign of forced entry, I explained my suspicions about my neighbor. The officers listened, but informed me that without any evidence of a break-in, there was little they could do. Feeling vulnerable and unable to stay alone, I called my sister. She offered me a place at her house for a few days. Those days passed too quickly, and soon it was Saturday evening and I was driving back to my apartment, trying to convince myself that everything would be fine, that my neighbor had probably given up whatever he was planning. As I entered the building, the sun had just set, and the stairwell was dimly lit. I crept up the stairs quietly, not wanting to alert my neighbor to my return. Reaching my floor, I saw his door shut, which eased my tension momentarily. I unlocked my door, entered quickly, and locked it behind me. Dropping my bag in the hallway, I flicked on the lights as I walked into my living room. My heart stopped. I screamed and stumbled back. The man was there, sitting on my couch staring at me with a terrifying grin. I didn't think, I just ran. 
I bolted out of the building, got into my car, and immediately called the police again, waiting for them in a parking lot nearby. When the officers arrived, we went back together. They entered my apartment and found the man still on the couch, casually sitting as if it were his own home. They detained him, and during a quick search, they found a small knife in his pocket. But what truly horrified me came later. Upon questioning, the man confessed to breaking into my apartment three times. I only knew about two incidents, which meant there was a time he was inside without my knowledge, possibly watching me. This revelation left me deeply shaken, questioning the safety of my own home. I work for a company that sells large amounts of products from a tiny warehouse. The items we sell are sometimes very pricey, so I was hired to keep an eye on the place during the late hours and into most of the night. Since the warehouse is small, there's not much need to patrol it all night long. I mostly sit in the office and watch the live feeds from several security cameras. For the first three years on the job, nothing ever happened. No one ever showed up at odd hours. There were no attempts to break in. Absolutely nothing. It was a dull job, and often left me feeling less alert at night, even though staying alert was essentially my job. On this particular night, I drove into the tiny parking lot and parked near the front door, right beside the car of the only other employee still there. When I entered, I let him know I had arrived, and he left soon after. I checked all the doors and made sure the systems were running smoothly. Then, I settled back in the office and stared at the screens. After about half an hour, my attention started to fade, and I took out my phone. I still glanced at the camera feeds every 30 seconds or so, but nothing ever changed. Then, just before 1 a.m., the system beeped. I had only heard this sound during the initial checks I performed at the start of my shifts, so this was the first time something real had triggered it. Quickly, I checked the alert and saw it was for motion detection. Someone was walking by the boundary line. It took a few moments to find the right camera, but eventually, on the back side of the building, I spotted a man walking right at the edge of where the parking lot meets the grass. He wore a thick hoodie and was too far away to see his face clearly. The direction he was walking didn't lead to anywhere important. That's why I'd never gotten alerts before. Our warehouse is too isolated for anyone to have a reason to walk or drive by. I watched as he moved towards the end of the parking lot, switching between cameras to keep him in view. Suddenly he stopped for a moment and turned to look directly at the building. He swiveled his head, scanning the area before stepping onto the concrete and walking toward the side of the warehouse. The situation quickly shifted from simply strange to potentially serious. As he moved along the side of the building, he paused at every door, inspecting each without trying to open them. He just looked around quietly and continued walking. When he reached the corner, he rounded it to the front and approached the main entrance. From the safety of the cameras, I observed him knock on the door, the sound echoing inside the warehouse. Rising from my seat, I slowly opened the office door and peeked down the hallway to see the man standing behind the glass doors. I doubted he could see me through the reflective glass, so I paused in the doorway to observe him. He peered inside and knocked again. Returning to the office, I pressed the speaker button to address him. This is private property. You must leave now. Through the camera, I saw him glance towards the speaker. He seemed ready to speak, but instead furrowed his brow and knocked once more. At that moment, an unsettling feeling washed over me, a gut reaction to his peculiar actions. Focusing on the camera, I noticed he kept one hand hidden in his pocket, which alarmed me. It might be more dangerous than I first thought. I dialed the police on our security system, establishing an immediate connection, and began describing what was happening. As I relayed details to the dispatcher from the hallway, the man suddenly pulled an object from his pocket and smashed it against the door. I couldn't make out the object clearly, but the sound and impact suggested it was metal, likely aimed at breaking the glass. I hurried back to the office, hearing more thuds as I secured the heavy door behind me. Once safe, I checked the cameras again, only to see the man running off. Within moments he had vanished from all camera views. As I waited for the police, I reviewed the footage and saw clearly. He was wielding a small gun, using its handle to strike the glass. We filed a detailed report, but despite having clear footage, the man remained unidentified. We still didn't know his intentions. 
but his aggressive response to my warning indicated he didn't care that I was inside. The glass door now sported a small crack, a grim reminder that he was moments away from breaking in, forcing me to confront whatever he had planned. Recently, I went to a dance club for the first time with some friends for a girl's night out. They teased me a lot because I chose not to drink on my first outing to a big city club. I wanted to stay clear-headed until I was sure I understood everything that was happening around me. Despite this, my friends kept pushing me to drink, trying to make me feel like I wasn't being fun. I wasn't even sure if I would enjoy clubbing at all. It was this group of friends who had persuaded me to come, but I wasn't used to drinking. If that was supposed to be the only way to have fun at a club, I doubted I'd like it. After some arguing, they finally let it go, and we all took a rideshare from the place where we had met. As soon as we were dropped off downtown, I began to doubt my decision. The area overwhelmed my senses with loud music blaring from every bar and some cars. People were stumbling at every corner, filling up the sidewalks. There was shouting, occasional fights, and the air was filled with the smells of smoke, urine, and vomit. It was almost enough to make me drink just to block out all the details. My friends seemed to have already reached that point before we even left. While we waited in line to get inside the club, we talked to all the men around us. We waited for 20 minutes, and during that time, I kept thinking about my outfit, how much skin I was showing, who I was with, and what I was doing. Every time a man tried to talk to me, I brushed them off, which made my friends tease me again. I was already regretting becoming friends with these people and realized I had never been very close to them. I had started hanging out with them randomly because I shared a class with one of them. I was going through some kind of end of college crisis where I thought I needed to party more. These girls seemed like the right crowd to introduce me to the party scene. Yet, as it turned out, I just wasn't enjoying it. Just as I was about to give up and go home, we reached the front of the line and I found myself walking into the club. I hoped it would be better inside, but it was the exact opposite. The club was filled with an overwhelming smell of artificial smoke. Loud music bounced off the walls, trapping us in a barrage of sound. I was squeezed into a tight space with hundreds of people. We made our way to the bar, and my friends quickly ordered some expensive drinks. I tried to order a water, but it seemed like the bartender could tell I wasn't going to buy alcohol. He ignored me and moved on to the next customer. Suddenly my friends had their drinks and vanished into the crowd. I was left trying to catch the bartender's attention, but it was no use. I looked around, and they were nowhere to be seen. I felt tears welling up. I was upset and wanted to leave, so I pulled out my phone to call a rideshare. That's when someone tapped me on the shoulder. The bartender's ignoring you, huh? Let me get that drink for you. A guy shouted over the music, his face uncomfortably close to mine. No thanks, I'm good. I replied, nearly yelling. I was just going to get water anyway. I was about to leave. The guy looked disappointed. But didn't you just get here? He persisted. I was at a loss for words, but then I didn't have a chance to respond. Those friends of yours, did they ditch you? He pressed. I tried to hide my reaction, but he saw right through me. A wave of anxiety and fear hit me. Damn it, I thought. I'm alone, and this stranger knows it. I haven't even been here five minutes. Thankfully, I was sober since I hadn't drunk anything, but I was overwhelmed with too many emotions to think clearly. I decided the best thing to do was to leave right away. I didn't say another word to the creepy guy or bother to look for my friends. I got up from the bar and headed straight for the exit. The guy called out to me, and I knew he was following me. My heart sank. Was leaving a mistake? Perhaps, but I needed to stick to my decision. I left the club and quickly ordered a rideshare to a random spot two blocks away. I needed to escape the chaos. Just as my rideshare said they were close, I heard the guy calling me again. He was actually running after me. I knew I hadn't left anything behind at the bar. There was no good reason for him to chase me. As he nearly reached me, I stepped into the street, causing a car to screech to a halt and honk. Then I turned around as he reached out to grab me, and I screamed at him, Leave me alone! I don't know you! My voice cut through the noise of the night. Everyone in the vicinity stopped and looked our way. That moment of attention was exactly what I needed. What better time to draw attention than now? With everyone looking at him, 
The man raised his hands and stepped back. Once he moved to the opposite sidewalk, I hurried on my way. When I turned the corner two blocks later and reached the designated pickup spot, I was glad to see a few people still around, though not many. But the Uber was still two minutes out, plenty of time for that creepy guy to find me again if he really tried. I stood on the curb, anxiously tapping my foot, constantly scanning my surroundings. Across the street, a man on his phone kept looking over at me. A minute later, another man came around the corner at the end of the block. He too was on his phone, switching his gaze between me and the first man. He walked slowly down the sidewalk, edging closer to where I stood. Just then, my Uber turned the corner I had come from, and I waved it down. But at that same moment, I noticed the creep from the club approaching, also on his phone. Suddenly, I realized another car had rounded the opposite corner, and now the street's only occupants were me, the three men, and the two cars. Panic set in. Which car was my Uber? Which was a trap? Thankfully, one car had an Uber light and looked like the typical Uber with its driver. As it pulled up, I didn't hesitate. I dashed in front of it and jumped inside, urging the driver to lock the doors. He managed to lock them, just as one of the men tried the handle on the door I had just closed. Without asking for any explanation, the driver sped away. I thanked the driver over and over as he drove me back to my friend's place. Well, I should say my ex-friends. Because when I recounted what had happened, they blamed me. They said it was my fault for leaving them behind, even though they were the ones who left me first. Choose your friends wisely, folks. I spent a lot of my late teen years working at my dad's restaurant. It was just a normal place for eating out, but we kept the doors open until 2 a.m. every night. While I was still in high school, I only worked there after school until 8 p.m. But after I graduated, I started taking the late shifts to save up some money for college. The place was quite busy at night, right up to when we closed. Most customers came to pick up orders they made online, but sometimes groups of friends would stay and eat at the tables. I really liked working the night shifts because it was just me, and I didn't have to deal with my dad telling me what to do all the time. But after about six months of night shifts, strange things began happening. One night, close to closing time at around 1.45 a.m., I was in the back cleaning up when I heard the entrance door chime. I finished what I was doing and walked to the front counter. Two young guys were there, looking exhausted. One walked up to the counter while the other lingered by a table. The guy at the counter just stared at the menu board and didn't say a word. It felt really awkward. He looked past me as if he was checking out the place. Suddenly the guy at the table left quickly and the one at the counter followed him out. It was by far one of the weirdest things I had ever seen and I couldn't come up with any logical reason for their behavior. I started to think maybe they had planned to rob the place but changed their minds last minute. The next day, I told my dad about what happened. He suggested that I start locking the doors around 1.45 a.m. for a few days. A week passed without any other odd incidents. Then, one night at about 1.30 a.m., right after a customer left with his order, one of those men from before came back. It was the guy who had been standing at the table. He was even wearing the same clothes as last time. This time, though, he walked up to the counter. He looked into my eyes briefly, then asked if I could help him jumpstart his car. The way he said it was really eerie, and I could tell there was something more behind his request. I'm sorry, I can't leave the restaurant while I'm working, I told him, trying to stay calm. His expression quickly turned to a frown. He insisted it would only take a minute, and no one would even know I had stepped out. At that moment, I felt a strong sense that something was very wrong, and I began to panic inside. He moved towards the door, signaling for me to follow him. I was truly scared and not sure what to do. My body was reacting, adrenaline rushing through me, preparing me to either fight or flee. It's important to note that I'm not a very big person, and this man was significantly larger than me. I also suspected his friend was close by, possibly waiting to ambush me if I tried to escape or resist, but I felt trapped either way, so I decided to prepare for a possible confrontation. I grabbed a pair of scissors from behind the counter and stood ready. The man turned around as he reached the door his face now showing anger, and he demanded again that I follow him. Just then, a loud noise erupted behind me, 
followed by the sound of the back door being thrown open. I dashed to the back, and as the man saw me, he quickly ran outside. I spun around and hurried back to the front counter, only to find that his companion had also disappeared. I immediately called the police and showed them the security footage, but it was of such low quality that it was difficult to identify anyone. I'm still not entirely sure why they didn't just attack me and rob the place directly. My best guess is that they intended to commit the robbery without causing physical harm, and when they realized I was ready to defend myself, they decided to flee. They could have easily overpowered me and made the situation much worse, so I'm relieved it didn't go down that way. This story began last February. I decided to take a week off after the new year, hoping that most people would be back at work. This way, I thought the streets and shops wouldn't be crowded, and I could relax. My plan was simple, to spend some time shopping and mostly just relax at home by myself. On one particular day, after driving around in the snowy weather and visiting several shops, I returned to my apartment by 7 p.m. Once home, I cooled down and settled on the sofa with some snacks I had picked up. I was watching TV and starting to feel sleepy after the day out, when suddenly, around 8.30 p.m., the PA system in my apartment made a loud buzz. This meant someone was at the building's main door, asking to be let in. I wasn't expecting anyone, so I was confused about who it could be. The buzzer went off again, so I reluctantly got up and moved towards the window that looked out onto the front of the building. I carefully lifted the blinds just a bit, enough to see who was there without being seen myself. Standing at the door was a tall man. The night was still filled with falling snow and shadows, but I could make out that he was probably in his mid-40s. I didn't recognize him at all. Considering that there were only three other residents in the complex, I knew all my neighbors, and this man was definitely not one of them. I thought that if he lived here, or was visiting someone, they would surely let him in. I walked back to the PA system, turned it off without responding, and went back to the couch to continue watching my show. I didn't think much of it after that and fell asleep a few times over the next hour. Finally, I turned off the TV and headed to bed, trying to shake off the strange feeling left by the visitor at the door. It was now around 10 p.m. As soon as my head hit the pillow, I fell into a deep sleep. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, a loud thud right outside my bedroom jolted me awake. The noise was sharp and sudden, leaving me confused and scared. I wasn't sure what it was or where exactly it had come from. My heart pounded as I lay there, staring at my bedroom door, listening intently for any other sounds. Everything went silent again, as if nothing had happened. I cautiously got out of bed and tiptoed to the door, pressing my ear against it to listen. All I could hear was the occasional creak of the building settling. Slowly, I turned the doorknob and peeked into the living room. Everything seemed normal at first glance. The apartment was enveloped in darkness, and a strange feeling urged me to stay silent and unseen. I decided not to turn on any lights as I moved through the living room and glanced down the front hallway. To my horror, the door to my apartment was wide open. I froze, staring at the gaping doorway, a wave of fear washing over me. It felt surreal. I cautiously retreated, my steps silent, and noticed a large dent in the wood near the doorknob on my door as I moved closer to my bedroom. Seeing the damage, panic took over. I quickly ran into my room, locked the door behind me and hid in the closet, dialing 911. I was certain the intruder was still somewhere in my apartment, and it seemed only a matter of time before they would try to enter my room. But as I waited in fear for the police to arrive, the apartment remained eerily quiet. By the time the police arrived, the intruder had disappeared. The officers found no trace of him. They speculated that the intruder might have tried buzzing other apartments too until someone unknowingly let him in. Once inside the building, it was unclear why he targeted my apartment. Perhaps he thought it was empty. The most puzzling part was the dent on my bedroom door, likely the cause of the loud thud that woke me. It seemed to be a single forceful hit, not an attempt to break in, but possibly an act of frustration before he left. I still live in the same apartment, and nothing similar has happened since. The identity and motives of the intruder remain a mystery. One night, when sleep was far from my reach, I decided to take a stroll through the nearby park. 
Life was tough at that moment. My mom was battling an illness. I had just lost my job, and my long-term girlfriend and I had recently split up. The walls of my small apartment seemed to close in on me, and the endless scrolling on my phone wasn't helping anymore. Living just a short walk from a quiet park with a small pond and some ducks seemed like a blessing that night. I grabbed a leftover bag of frozen peas from my freezer, thinking maybe I could feed the ducks. Stepping out into the chilly night air, I noticed it was just after midnight on a quiet Tuesday. The streets were nearly empty, a rare sight, since losing my job had thrown off my whole routine of sleep and waking hours. The silence was unusual, but somewhat soothing. Without the usual hustle and bustle, I didn't even feel like listening to music as I walked to the park, which was also unusually quiet and dark. The street lamps were sparse and dim, adding to the night's eeriness. During the day, there was usually at least one homeless person resting on a park bench. Wanting to be respectful, I walked quietly towards the pond. Sitting down by the water's edge, I looked for the ducks. They were nestled in a bunch of cattails, barely visible through the algae. They seemed to be asleep, barely moving even when I sat down nearby. Disappointed, I set the bag of peas beside me, abandoning my hope of feeding them. It would have been nice to watch them eat and hear their quacks, but I didn't want to disturb their sleep by throwing peas at them. So there I sat, alone in the dark, wrapped in silence. Or so I thought. Moments later my solitude was interrupted by a quiet voice. Excuse me, the voice said gently. Startled, I turned to see a man approaching. I'm sorry to bother you, but could I have that bag of peas? He looked like he might be living on the streets. I hadn't noticed him sleeping on a nearby bench, hidden just behind me with his belongings. It seemed my noisy handling of the pea bag had woken him, or maybe he too was struggling to find sleep. Um, sure, I replied, handing him the bag. I brought them for the ducks, but they're sleeping, so they're all yours. He chuckled softly as he took the bag. You snooze, you lose, he joked, returning to his bench. It was just a small bag of cold, plain peas, but any snack is better than none in the middle of the night. He didn't ask for anything else. As I resumed my quiet contemplation, listening to him rustle the bag and then dispose of it, a calmness washed over me. The night breeze whispered through the trees, creating ripples on the pond's surface. Finally, something felt right. But the peace was shattered by a sudden chill, the cold touch of metal against my neck. A stern voice followed. Don't turn around. Take your phone and wallet out of your pockets and hand them over your shoulder. I quickly pulled out my phone and handed it over, but I didn't have my wallet on me. Where's your wallet? The mugger demanded, his voice sharp and cold. I didn't bring it. I really don't have it, I replied. That's a lie. Hand it over now. He pressed the cold metal harder against my neck. Don't force me to hurt you, he threatened. I'm telling the truth. I don't have it. Look, I'll show you, I insisted, hoping he would believe me. I started to empty my pockets to prove I was telling the truth, but he wasn't convinced. Maybe I should just end this quickly, he muttered darkly. I tensed up, preparing for the worst, but then a familiar voice called out. Hey! The voice shouted. The pressure on my neck vanished as the mugger turned to see who it was. It was too late for him to react. Almost instantly after the shout, a heavy thud sounded, and the mugger fell to the ground behind me. I jumped up and saw the homeless man from earlier, standing with a large rock in his hand and a serious look on his face. Thank you, I managed to say. He just nodded briskly. Grab your things and leave. Make sure you're both gone before he wakes up. I picked up my phone from the ground, and when I looked up again, the man was already gathering his belongings. We left the park quickly, each going our own way, without any more words exchanged. Glancing back one last time, I saw the homeless man disappearing into the shadows of the city streets and the mugger starting to stir. I rushed home, locking the door behind me. Although the night's events didn't help my insomnia, they definitely made me appreciate the safety of my apartment. I kept thinking about the homeless man. I wished I could have done something more to thank him. It seemed he didn't help me just for the peas earlier. He was just that kind of person who helped others no matter what.